Hello, my name is Father Boniface. I'm a Benedictine priest and monk of St. Vincent d'Arch Abbey in Latrobe, Pennsylvania, and I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to speak with Father Claude Franklin, priest of a Maronite priest of the eparchy of St. Maron in Brooklyn and currently assigned to St. John the Baptist Parish in Newcastle. Father Claude, it's great to be with you. Thank you, Father. It's great to be with you. We'll just begin by entrusting our conversation to Our Lady, ask for her intercession to help us discuss the things that the Lord wants us to talk about and help our listeners also to hear what they most need to hear. Hail Mary, full full of of grace, grace, the Lord Lord is with thee. Blessed Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Father Claude, for the sake of our listeners, can you just give a couple of biographical details uh, when you were uh, ordained, how old you are, and just uh, just to, uh, where, where you grew up, just some, some basic uh, starting points. Sure. I was born on February 12th, 1972 in Fayetteville, North Carolina. I'm a Tar Hill. <laughs> <laughs> I was ordained as a Maronite priest on November the 29th, 1997. So I just celebrated my 16th uh, anniversary of priesthood this past Friday. Praise God. Congratulations. Thank you. Basically, I grew up in Fayetteville for 19 of my years. This coming February, I'll be 42. I went to the seminary when I was 19 years old. Wow. Can can you give us a little window into what faith was like? You you obviously grew up Maronite, mm, sort of. So, <laughs> <laughs> great. That's, that's its own story. Yeah. <laughs> should, we, should I start there? That'd be great. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. When I was growing up, until I was about seven years old, never really went to church. My mother is German from Germany. She came to America when she was twelve was technically a Latin Catholic, but wasn't practicing. And my father had never been baptized anything. And when they met, they were married in a Methodist church just because they would marry them. (laughs) (laughs) Right. So when my sister, who's five years older than I, and I were born, we never were baptized as children, since neither parent was practicing anything. But that doesn't mean that we didn't really have a Christian household. I mean, there were usually some pictures of Jesus Mm. and, you know, we celebrated Christmas, but we weren't an active church going family. When I was about seven, a neighbor of my mother's who was Catholic and in the South, to be Catholic's pretty rare in the right, Bible right. Belt. She invited my mother to come to church with her. This lady was originally from the North and had moved down to the South and knew my mother was Catholic. And this is uh, in like 1979. So in the midst of all the post-Vatican II uh, things right, going on. Right. And... This lady was sought out and found our church because it was tend to be very more traditional, the Maronite Catholic Church, mm. and invited my mother. My my mother said, sure. But the lady goes, well, I, I go to a slightly different Catholic church. <laughs> what do you mean slightly different? She had never heard that there's all these other traditions of the uh, church, which most people aren't aware of, that right. the Catholic church is actually made up of 22 Catholic churches, one Western, the Latin one, and 21 Eastern Catholic right, churches. Right. The lady goes, well, yes, they're Maronites. My mom hadn't heard of Maronite from Mennonite, well, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so my mother goes and uh, enjoyed the uh, liturgy and the priest, and it reminded her sort of the days when she was in Germany, because we still use incense uh, all the time, and it just kind of brought things kind of home for her. So she went, and my, my dad's attitude was, if you want to go and be Catholic and raise the kids Catholic, that's fine. Just don't come home preaching to me. 
Mom goes, we don't do that. We're Catholic. Because <laughs> he was used to the knock on the door right. uh, type of a thing. Of course, I guess she didn't realize we're supposed to be out there doing that. But uh, a few weeks go by, and uh, one Sunday, my dad's getting dressed in his suit. And my mom looks at him and says, you know, where are you going? She thought he had his days mixed up like he was going to to work. And she goes, where are you going? He goes, well, I want to go to church to see what everyone is talking about. She goes, well, okay, just remember, you decided this, not me. He said, I know. He told me years later that I still get chills from <laughs> that when he walked into the church, before the liturgy had even started, he felt he had come home. Wow. Wow. Oh, beautiful. And after the liturgy, he was convinced this is the church. Mm. And um, the priest was just starting a, what he called an inquiry class. And it was mm. not meant just for people like my father, but people like my mother who had been away for a while, people that had been going to church but didn't know what Maronite was, you know, what right. are the difference between the Maronites and the Latin church and et cetera. And, he asked my mom, he saw it in the bulletin and said, did you sign me up for that class? She said, no, I didn't sign you up. <laughs> Do you want to go? You sign yourself up. She goes, I'll go with you if you want, but I didn't sign you up. He goes, all right. So he called and he signed himself up and my mother. And they started going. And uh, after about a year of, of the classes, the priest I was like, well, I've covered the basics. You know, you have any questions? And my father said, yes. When do I and my children get baptized? Wow. Beautiful. And so on May 25th, 1980, huh. it was Pentecost Sunday. During the liturgy, my father, my sister, and myself were baptized as Maronites. Because in the Eastern tradition, you follow the church of your father. Right. And my father literally was baptized before us and chose to be Maronite. <laughs> Had I been baptized even that day before my father, I would have become a Latin Catholic. Huh. That's interesting. By the way, the canon law was worked because then you would follow the Catholic party. And, right, right. But the priest did it all right. So from that day forward, I became a Maronite Catholic. To my knowledge, I'm I'm jumping ahead a little bit here, but I'm... I'm the only non-Middle Eastern, 100% Maronite, 0% Middle Eastern Maronite priest in the whole world. <laughs> wow. There are priests who were Latin Catholics and they switched before, or they were Latin priests that switched, or the, or we have bi-rituals, like Father, you, I know you're bi-ritual yes. now, but... I'm the only one I know that's in that situation. There that's are amazing. people like myself, my my sister's the same way, uh, that is non-Middle Eastern but a Maronite, but I'm the only one that I know that's a priest. So I guess that's some kind of important standing that's in the amazing. church. But it actually answers a question that I've had because I've, I've always wondered, looking at you, where I wonder where that Maronite, where that Lebanese blood is hiding. <laughs> <laughs> you don't look real Lebanese. <laughs> well, as I always tell my people in Arabic, I tell them, Ana Maruni bil albi mish bil dam, which means I'm Maronite or Ana Lebanani. You sometimes you say I'm Lebanese or I'm Maronite in my heart, not in my blood. <laughs> <laughs> it's been kind of the story of my life and I've had many adventures uh, before going to Newcastle. <laughs> That's amazing. And of course, Maronite is not about being Lebanon, Lebanese. No, uh, it's, no. It's a, it's a full rite in the Catholic Church and is, uh, you know, has, has its own expression of that, but it has a very Lebanese foundation to it. Yes. And sometimes people say, oh, do you, you belong to the Lebanese church? I said, no, I belong to the Maronite <laughs> church. And that's one of the unfortunate things of many of the um, other Eastern Catholic churches, they tend to have a, an ethnic title to them, right. like national U quality, right? Ukrainian Catholic Church, the Russian Catholic Church, you know, et cetera, which then makes people say, well, 
I'm not that, so I can't belong, or you may, maybe not even want to explore it because I'm not that. Uh, where our our name comes from, Saint Marin, who was a a monk and hermit who actually tried to kind of get away from it all. And <laughs> people found him, and after he was so popular that after his death, they followed his ways, and that's where they became known as Marinite followers of Marin. Right. So right. our name doesn't. It's it's its own nation, so yes, to speak. In indeed. fact, sometimes they talk about the Maronite nation hmm. versus uh, you know being an a ethnic uh, an association. So, so yes, you, you, anyone can belong uh, to the Maronite Catholic faith. And even as you mentioned, the woman who was influential for your mother had found in the Maronite uh, celebration of the liturgy and the. You know, in the Maronite Church, had found a very beautiful, a very tr- attractive way to live out her Catholic faith, and so was practicing by by attending the Maronite Church. And certainly, that opportunity is also available to any of the the folks in our listening audience to, uh, to visit one of the Maronite churches. There are a number in the Pittsburgh area, a little little cluster yeah. of, uh, of of Maronite Catholics in the Pittsburgh area. Yes, yeah, like in that lady's case. She remained as a Latin Catholic all her life. I mean, she passed away a couple of years ago. God rest her soul. But then you have somebody like my mother who switched. You know, you, you can technically switch within the church, and <laughs> you're still Catholic, but you're just now belonging to a particular branch of the Catholic Church. My mother decided, well, I'm going there. This is the church. My husband and my my son's a priest, and, you know, and why not be fully that? Mm. And uh, so she made that choice. Somebody else didn't, you know. The only time it really gets complicated is at times for marriage, <laughs> some, some of the sacraments. <laughs> right. But the church can always uh, take care of things. Ecclesia supla, right? Yes. The church will supply. Uh, we can always get a dispensation for something from somebody. That's right. <laughs> so, yeah. so it's nothing to fear, but. No, we should encourage people to to see the real fullness of the uh, of the Catholic Church. That's what makes us Catholic. Universality. Yes. If you know, it's not about being one in the sense of uniformity, all the same. But we're we're one. Like uh, we were talking over lunch about uh, Pope Francis' idea about this harmony. Mm. Well, that surely is the expression of the Catholic faith that we each have our own little tone and tune in there. But when it's all put together, that's what makes the faith Catholic. Mm. Yeah, and so beautiful. Harmony is, uh, is is such a beautiful thing to listen to and yes. certainly to experience and the, the richness, the cultural diversity that should exist within the Catholic Church. Yes. The, the, uh, the, the Catholic faith illumines, enlightens, leavens anything that's authentically human. And uh, there's more that's authentically human than can be captured in any single culture. Yes. Well, I often point out to my my people. Uh, Father knows that I'm uh, I study liturgy and I'm, I have a degree in liturgy and I'm working on my doctorate in liturgy. And sometimes the things that irritate me is when we have new liturgical reforms where they they do things like, oh, we used to have like. Oh, glory and praise and exaltation and magnificence are to be lifted up to you, O oh Lord. They say, oh, that's too many words. We'll just say, glory to you, O oh Lord. <laughs> you know? It's like, w- there's a reason why our ancestors put all those words, because not one word is, is sufficient enough to express mm. who God is. Mm. And certainly that that's the same thing with, you know, each part of the Catholic Church has its own beauty. You know, it's not that one of the churches is better or more beautiful than the other. They're all beautiful. They all have their own characteristics that they can share. And, you know, different people need different ways. You know, we we can come at the same thing from, you know, 15 different angles. <laughs> right. And, and that's the beauty. Why do we have to have only one way? Right. You know, to express that one faith. <laughs> and to come back to that image of harmony, the, the harmony is lost if the base becomes the tenor. The yes. harmony depends on the bass being the bass and the tenor being the tenor and the soprano being the soprano and you know the the voices being authentically what they are called to be yes. and then the harmony begins to emerge from that in you know and there's a little dissonance in there and then there's a little resolution in there and I think we experience that in our different experiences of uh of the rites in the church as well there's some things that seem to be a little bit 
intention while well, they do it this way there and we do it this way there and that's not quite the same and other things that are very harmonious uh, or, or resonant I suppose between mm-hmm. uh, between the different rites and all of that highlights the beauty that the Holy Spirit as Pope Francis expressed early on in, in his papacy the he says it seems like you know the Holy Spirit is the one who's inspiring all of this difference it says that it seems like the Holy Spirit is the big divider in the church but then the Holy Spirit makes a harmony out of all of that diversity that he also inspires. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and that's something really beautiful. Yes. Father Claude, can you take us in, the, in an, an, another step in your journey? How, so you, you became Maronite Catholic and you began to experience the, the Catholic Church in, uh, in the Maronite Catholic Church in, in North Carolina. And then uh, how did things develop from there? Well, the priest at the time that we had he actually saw something in me. And I say this to all priests that might be listening out there. Mm. If you see a young man who you think would be a good priest, take an interest, Mm. say something. You don't have to say, do you want to be a priest? Or you ever thought of, (laughs) sometimes that maybe it's not the way to go about it, (laughs) but simple ways. uh, He, he noticed that, I was always, like, I guess, enamored by the liturgy from a, that young age at seven. Mm. And that, unlike most kids who were moving around, and I was, like, just so enthralled by what was going on at the altar that he, during these lessons that my father and mother were going through, he actually asked my dad, do you think your son would like to be a server? And my dad said, I don't know, Father, why don't you ask him? <laughs> my, my dad wouldn't force me like some parents would right. do. And so uh, he, the priest did. He asked me, and he had me serving on the altar before I was even baptized. That's great. <laughs> Maybe not legitimate or whatever, <laughs> but uh, I didn't receive communion, obviously. But, but I was on the altar already. So from, a, from seven years old, hmm. and then, of course, once I received communion, I was... I served on the altar every Sunday. I don't remember even being at, like sick on a Sunday that like I, I wasn't at the altar. And then when I went to college, my first uh, year of college, I went to a place uh, was about an hour away. I would come home every weekend and serve at the uh, altar and then go back to, uh, to college. Wow. I, I just felt that connection. And, during that summer between my first year of college, we had a gentleman who was studying from our parish who was originally uh, Anglican who had converted. Hmm. In fact, my dad did his classes. Oh, wow. <laughs> my dad became the catechist for the adults for the, our parish and later on became a subdeacon in our wow, church. Wow, beautiful. And he also did Bible study and all kinds of stuff. So <laughs> talk about from nothing to everything. Yeah, really. Amazing. But... Uh, this gentleman had entered the seminary and during that summer he and I were talking and I asked him all kinds of questions and I talked to the priest and uh, I asked to to be able to go to the seminary. I decided like at the last minute before I'm supposed to be going back to college and you know for the second year. So I applied and uh, they were concerned because at the time they were sending our younger guys that ha- didn't have a bachelor's degree, like to Boston College or to some other, you know, uh, Latin pre-seminary program. And even then I was like, but I'm Maronite. I I want to go to the Maronite seminary. (laughs) I don't know anything else, you know? So I had to have a special meeting with the rector of the seminary. So I go to Washington, D.C., which is where our Maronite seminary, which is the only one outside of Lebanon in the world. So I go there. And I meet with uh, the rector of the seminary, and one of his concerns was I was 19 years old, which was kind of early to go in. <laughs> I am, I, maybe in retrospect, I probably should have waited a little bit, but God does what he does. That's right. The next youngest guy at the seminary was like in his 40s, and the oldest wow. gentleman was 62. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and he was like, I'm a little concerned, you know, the the age differences here, he goes, uh, how do you think you would deal with that? I said, well, how I look at it, whether it's now or three, four years from now, if I come in, 
I'm going to have to be dealing eventually with people in a parish from of all kinds of ages. Amen. So wouldn't this be the good training ground for that? He said, good answer. Let's sign you up. <laughs> so I think I was on like a probation for the first year, just kind of like, you know, because they had never done that before. And I don't even know if they ever did it after me. Wow. <laughs> I don't know if that's a good sign or a bad <laughs> sign. But, but I stayed there. I did my undergraduate. And um, I received my bachelor's in philosophy from Oblate College, mm. which is no longer there in Washington, D.C., but the Oblates of Mary Immaculate. And then uh, I did my th- master's in theology also from Oblates of Mary Immaculate. And then I was ordained as a priest, as I said, November 29th, 1997. From there, I had my first assignment, which was to go to Lebanon. <laughs> wow. Yeah, which was a whole nother adventure. <laughs> I don't know how much time wow. we have here to even go <laughs> to everything. Well, if we can just uh, pause for a moment in, sure. your, in your seminary experience. Um, obviously, it's a different experience to be in seminary as opposed to being in the parish. And you're you're learning a lot of things and they're whatever, different different challenges, different opportunities, a, a deepening in your own faith. And, and maybe even that question of... Uh, you know how how did you how did your sensitivity to to God's voice to even to respond to the call to know that besides just sort of enjoying priest stuff that you could really say I, I think that you know God is calling me to to the seminary. Well, that's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say that uh, really from the moment when I was about twelve years old, I felt this drawing. I mean, I guess even earlier. Obviously, I said about when I was seven, but. When I was about 12 years old, I told the, that priest that had uh, had me at the altar, because he was still our pastor at the time, I want to be a priest. Wow. I remember talking to him about that. But during the teenage years, right, for natural right. reasons. Some distractions. You, right. You kind of put that aside. and But something was calling me. Because that first year of college when I went, like, I didn't do too well in school. I got distracted by the natural things, uh, you know, uh, ooh, parties, you know, and uh, my grades suffered. I mean, I was a straight-A student in high school, and then all of a sudden, everything Mm. went down. And I knew that wasn't me. And the reason I was going to college is I was actually trying to study to be a lawyer. Because one of the things, because I wanted to be able to try and help people, you know, maybe defend people or... I don't know what I was thinking, but there was still some, there was some sense in me that I wanted to be able to serve people in some way. Beautiful. And I guess during that summer, I, I really realized that that's not where I was being called, but I was being called to, to something deeper. And I wasn't even sure maybe if it was the priesthood, but that's all I knew hmm. that I felt the calling toward. So I went and I had ups and downs during those six years I was at the the seminary for undergraduate and graduate. And I think we all do. Mm. You have your moments, but God's voice is so powerful that he, he calls you out of that darkness, out of those, those moments too of, of doubt and saying, you know, don't worry, I, I'm there. Mm. And, you know, <laughs> throughout my priesthood, I've had, low periods mm. and high periods and but he keeps he keeps calling it's it's really it's, it's very difficult to explain mm. people go how do you know you had the calling i mean it, it's like it, it's not like a phone call you know that, <laughs> i think it's part of the problem is we we use that terminology like as if like hello god you know <laughs> it's not that it's that uh, i always love to give the example of elijah on top of the mountain When Elijah was on top of the mountain, God's voice was not in the thunder, in the volcanoes, in the raging fires, and all that, but he was in the whispering wind. Mm. Well, we miss the whispering wind if we don't be quiet. Mm. And it's not only just a physical closing our mouth, which I often tell my parishioners, you know, Remember, God gave you two ears and one mouth so that you listen (laughs) twice as much as you speak to God. But we also have to 
silence all the distractions in our minds. And that's tough in order to, to, to really feel, is it God speaking to? The other thing is d- determining, is this God's voice or is right. it a, another spirit speaking? Is it the Holy right. Spirit or any other? Because the devil will use God's ways. He appears as an angel of light. Yes. But if he's prompting you in something that doesn't quite seem right, it probably isn't. Right. <laughs> you know, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably isn't. <laughs> it's the same kind of thing, I think, with the, the spiritual life. And that's what discernment is about. Absolutely. And I, I believe that, you know, people say, oh, you discerned your vocation. I, I'm like, no, I'm still discerning my vocation. <laughs> because there are you vocations. You it down a bit. Yeah. But there are vocations <laughs> within vocation. Absolutely. You know, what is God calling me for today? Right. Not only the big things, but in the small things, what is he calling me to do today? And that's tough to to always figure out, you know. You know, determining God's will <laughs> it's not an easy one, you know. That's right. And people want to come to the priest like we have the magic answer. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we can give you the tools, but we can't give you the answer. Only Jesus has the answer. Mm. Amen. And is the answer. Mm. So a lot of development of that interior life, probably during seminary as well, oh, learning yes. how to face those ups and downs and continue on the path and find the light that shines through in the darkness. And of course, going from typical, just go on a Sunday to now you're having daily liturgy and you're having, you know, praying together as a group, the morning and evening prayers and other devotionals, that that's a change of lifestyle. It's a change of lifestyle. <laughs> But it's beautiful. Yes. But it, it, it's it's not you know typically what nineteen year olds were doing. <laughs> you know? Indeed. Uh, but that that's part of formation. That's an important part of seminary formation mm. because you have to have the the basics. You got to get the basics down, and that's what's going to support you throughout the priesthood mm. too. Because if you don't learn to do them and to and to keep doing them, then your prayer life is going to falter. And sometimes my prayer life has faltered. Mm. And that's when I know I, I got to get back to the basics. You know, I think the most beautiful thing is people that can actually pray without the form formal prayers. That's, you know, but if we don't at least also do the formal along with the informal right, prayer, right. then, then there's something missing in our life. Right. Yeah, beautifully said. Yeah, the the support, the mutual support of of public and private prayer, the yeah. liturgy of the church being one with her and and we need words and we need ritual if we're going to pray together. Otherwise, it's it becomes kind of a crazy <laughs> right. uh mob scene, but uh but then also having that interior prayer and the private prayer is so so essential. So tell us about your first assignment. I'd love to hear about uh Lebanon the 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 one non Lebanese, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. the white Lebanese uh, Maronite priest who's so. the white boy. <laughs> um, well, the way this was presented to me was at the reception for my diaconate ordination. The bishop at the time, Bishop uh, Stephen Dwyhe, leans over to me and says, "You have passport." <laughs> uh, I said yes. Sayedna, Sayedna means like your excellency. Uh, literally means our Lord, uh, like your grace or something. Like that. I said yes, your excellency. Good. I want to send you to Lebanon. I was kind of like, uh, <laughs> thank you. Or what do you say? He goes, Forever. He, he was, he was, <laughs> after you're ordained priest I, i'm sending you oh okay so by the time we got all the, the paperwork and all that stuff done i had to get a visa and all this and they had just lifted the ban because there was a travel oh, wow. ban right because of the civil war in lebanon they had just lifted the travel ban uh, like a year or so before so i spent some time with my family for about a month or so and then uh, i went to new york while we were preparing things and then at the last minute i i was like I don't want to go, say it. No, I, I, I just, I, I said, I don't think I'm going to be able to handle this. He said, he said, why? 
I said, well, I said, I don't speak the language. I said, I obviously don't fit in. <laughs> I don't look the part. Yeah, I don't look the part. I, I just, I don't, I, I said, I just don't, I don't know. He goes, you know what my worry is? I said, what? He goes, that you're not going to want to come back. Wow. That's what he said. Prophetic. Said, yeah. I said, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I said, uh, okay. I said, I said, I'll go on the condition that if I don't feel like I can handle it, I can come back at any time. He said, fine, but you're going to be fine. Cause I was supposed to go for six months. I said, okay. So I leave in February of that year, 98. I'm traveling across the halfway across the world. My first time ever traveling by myself, ever traveling across the world. <laughs> the only place I'd been prior to out of the United States was Canada, which is wow. hardly <laughs> foreign <Different>. travel. <laughs> yeah. I have to go through London Heathrow, which is an interesting airport, airport if you've ever been there. And then I have to switch planes to get onto the Middle Eastern Airlines, which is the Lebanese airline, and then go to Beirut. And you have like this like five, six hour layover, you know, you have to, and you have to have your bags because they don't transfer because it's two different planes. And so you got all this stuff going on. Like I've never done any of this stuff before. Right? So I get on, finally get on the plane. I arrive in, in Lebanon and I, I, I didn't know at the time, but I was arriving at the old airport. They were currently building a new airport, which I didn't know. They, the old airport didn't have where the plane can connect to the airport. It was the old way, like you stop on the tarmac. You have to get on a bus. <laughs> nice, yeah. So I, I get out of the – I'm walking down the stairs of the of the plane, and I look at this bus. And on either side of the doors of the bus are these soldiers with guns, like machine guns. <laughs> and all I'm thinking is, I'm not in Kansas anymore <laughs> or North Carolina or wherever I am. So – I, I just follow everybody else. I don't know. Uh, I don't understand the language or anything. I just get on the bus with everyone else. We get into the airport itself, and all the signs are in Arabic or in French. I don't speak French. <laughs> I don't read French. I don't read Arabic. I don't speak Arabic. But I can make out enough of the French that I, I see there's three lines, one Libanais. I figured that must be Lebanese. <laughs> That's not me. Then the one étranger. Uh, now I know. I mean, I was like, I said, that looks like stranger, <laughs> foreigner. I said, That's that might be me. And then there was one for Arabs, right? Arabs. I said, I'm not Arab. I said, I, got, I guess I'm the foreigner line. But there was nobody in there because everybody else was in the other lines. That's amazing. So I took a chance. I said, let me go in the stranger line. <laughs> so I go there. The guy in the booth looks at the passport real quick, stamps it, hands it back to me like nothing. You know, I had my collar on and, you know, he, he welcomes me. I walk a few feet and there's a soldier who takes my passport again. Oh, my. I find out later this is a Syrian soldier because they were occupying Lebanon at the time. <laughs> he opens it up upside down. <laughs> goes through every single page and finally just kind of with a snarl on his face hands it back to me then i go to get my luggage and i didn't know they had these guys that were supposed to help you you know you could pay them a little or something but i didn't know that was like the the kind of the norm there so this guy's coming up trying to get me to <laughs> to let him help me with my luggage and oh i'm like gosh. no no i'm not giving anybody my luggage I'm in lebanon so <laughs> So I, I take my luggage oh, man. and I'm wheeling it. I'm just following everybody else. And all of a sudden I hear out of all these people, Father Claude. It was like, hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> the angelic voice yes. sifting through the chaos. <laughs> so I, uh, I meet this priest who's now a, a good priest friend of mine, Father Eli Mikhail. He's in Raleigh, North Carolina now, uh, our parish there. He actually came back to America with me when I came back that first oh, time nice. to study, and then he decided to stay and work here in America. But he's the one that picked me up. I stayed at the pa Patriarchal Seminary, and on the weekends I would go to the cathedral in a town called Batrun, 
which is in the northern part of Lebanon, right on the beach, the, the uh, cathedral is. Mm. And I got to know people, and I met some of the seminarians from that eparchy, the diocese of Batrun, who were studying at the Patriarchal Seminary. And so I would see them every weekend, and I would see them during the week, and Father Lee would take me back and forth. And and then I just went around, and I, I tried to travel, and I saw... I went from the north to the south to the east to the west of Lebanon mm. to as many old churches. I took pictures as I could of some of the historical sites, you know, not even just Christian sites, but just history. I just tried to take pictures and go everywhere I could that, that first time. And so the bishop comes in June. It's now, we're now like four months into my six month time. Uh, Cause every year the bishops have a, annual meeting with the patriarch in June. So he meets with me and I asked for an extension. (laughs) He goes, he goes, I knew it. (laughs) So he gave me like an extra month or so. And uh, I came back and within a month of coming back, I was assigned to Scranton, Pennsylvania. That was my first assignment as a priest in the United States And uh, I spent five and a half years there. After that, I got another interesting phone call, which was uh, from the secretary at at the chancery saying, Father Claude, Bishop Dwight, he wants you to call him. Okay. On his private cell phone in Lebanon. (laughs) (laughs) When the bishop calls you, usually you don't, you're like, you're sometimes like, mm, is this a good thing? Or, you know, you're not, so. Always leads to the most effective examination of conscience. Yes. <laughs> and usually, you know, if somebody was probably upset about something, but I was like, <laughs> I didn't do anything wrong. I, I don't even remember doing anything. Right. So, so I call him and he answers, hello, <laughs> which was his normal hello. So, hello. I said, Yes, see it my, my voice is cracking. <laughs> it's Claude. He goes, oh, yes. Are you sitting down? <laughs> yes. Maybe you should be laying down. <laughs> oh, no. Okay. He goes, on my way to Lebanon, I stopped off in Rome. And uh, I don't know for sure, but uh, I think it's going to go through. Uh, I want to send you to Rome to study. I'm waiting for to get you scholarship. <laughs> so now I'm like, there's like a pause, and I'm like, thank you? I mean, <laughs> I mean, how do you respond to that? So, But you're not allowed to tell anybody until it's certain. <laughs> I can't even tell my parents or anything. So, But eventually it came through. The parish I was in in Scranton was about to have their 100th anniversary, and we're having meetings, and oh, Father, you can uh, say this at the celebration. And I'm like, okay. And I'm like making notes for the the guy is going to follow me because I said I probably am not even going to be here, but I can't tell you. <laughs> and it, it it did. I I received a scholarship, and uh, to my knowledge, it was from the Oriental Congregation, the only American to ever get one because they usually only <laughs> give scholarships to some of the other poor. Eastern countries. And so I went to, to Rome and I studied uh, at the Oriental Institute, the Pontifical Oriental Institute. And I stayed at the Maronite college. I did that for three years. Wow. Can you, can you give us some, uh, some highlights of, of that experience? The, what, what was it like to be at uh, Rome's kind of the, the center of the world <laughs> in some sense, you know, I mean, there's kind of everything going on there and, but then to be in the Maronite community also, yeah. but that would be a more universal, not more universal than Lebanon, I suppose. Yeah. But It was an interesting time. I enjoyed it some ways, but it wasn't, I enjoyed Lebanon much more. And I know this probably sounds odd. People are like, Rome, Rome is a nice place to visit. <laughs> yeah. Some people love It'd it be hard to live, to, there. to live there, but I'm not a big city person. And I think that was maybe part of it. Like if I had to live in, even in Lebanon, like in Beirut, it wouldn't have been the same experience. I right, like small right. towns. It was a big town that to get to to school every 
day I had to take two buses, which were never on time. <laughs> the cobblestone roads are very quaint when you're visiting, but when you go on those bumpy roads every day, it's just not the same, you know? And after a while, it's like, I've seen one Roman ruin. I've seen them all. <laughs> you know, you kind of get jaded a little bit about yeah. it. And But when people would come to visit, I kind of like would be reinvigorated to show them the places. Right. See it through fresh eyes. Yeah. You see it through fresh eyes because, you know, plus you're, you're studying, you're there to study. And when you're waiting for a bus in the cold February rain, which it's very humid over there. So it kind of goes through you and it just kind of really uh, puts a damper on the (laughs) whole experience it's not like when people go there for five days and you know they're out eating drinking and being merry you know you're there to study the first thing i had to do was learn italian after you had already learned arabic which i did in in that first trip to lebanon which i've been back (laughs) since to lebanon that first trip i ended up learning arabic which i didn't know a lick of it when i went there it's amazing in that six to eight month period i i learned arabic so now I ha- I'm going to my – class, my classes are going to be in Italian. I had a six-week <laughs> uh, intensive course in the summer when the Romans are away because it's so hot in Rome. I'm studying Italian, <laughs> you know. But you do it. You do what you got to do. And, you know, eventually I learned it. I was able to take my classes in, in Italian. Wow. You had to be able to respond in Italian. And write things in Italian if you if necessary, not super proficient in it, but enough to get by. Right, and uh, you know you do what you got to do. But uh, I I have to say that you know there were some nice moments too. I mean, there's the first of all, the, there's the camaraderie between at the Maronite College. We have mostly from Lebanon, but we had Maronites from Syria. Some we, we had some other. Eastern uh, Catholic groups there, and we actually even had some Koreans. <laughs> we needed, a, we needed a, we had some empty rooms, and you know, you got to pay for the place, you got to rent out the place. <laughs> so, so we had some Koreans. So. They weren't Maronite Koreans. No, they weren't Maronite Koreans. <laughs> but uh, as I said, we tried to marinate them. You know? But uh, they were really good guys, and you know, had a good time. We would do some things. We would visit as a group. We went to Venice together as a group, mm-hmm. and probably one of the experiences I'll never forget is when Pope John Paul II passed away. Mm. I was in, living in Rome at the time. Didn't go for the funeral ceremony itself, but the night that he, they put his body out, mm. they laid his body out, we were having a priest meeting that night. And I think they had laid his body out around six or something like that in the evening. And hmm. our meeting was after dinner, like eight o'clock or something. So we're, we're here. We finish up the meeting about nine thirty, And one of the priests says to me, some of us are going down to, to uh, St. Peter's. You want to go with us? And I was like, I don't know. You know, it's getting late. And, and he, he goes, come on. And I'm glad he said, come on. He kind of of pushed me a little bit. And sometimes we need that. We have to nudge people, don't we? Mm, Because we can get so complacent. And I think I would have regretted for the rest of my life had I not done that. Didn't regret not going to the funeral just because of the madness that was there. Once he had, you know, a billion people or whatever it was that that seemed like it was out there. But it was the first night that we, we went down and... We got in line about 10.30. I mean, the line was already kind of long, but we got to the door of St. Peter's at 2 o'clock. Whoa. And they said they were going to close the doors at 2 (laughs) o'clock until like 4 for like cleaning. (gasps) Wow. So here we are. I said, I could see it. My luck typically is... The person in front of me would get in, even my friend or something. <laughs> they would close the door in front of me. You know, here I'm going to be standing for another couple hours. But I was going to do it, you know. And they decided not to close. 
And they ended up not closing. Wow, how beautiful. The whole time because they saw how many people came. Beautiful. So I was able to get in there and I said a a prayer for the Holy Father. And then we left because they wouldn't let you stay. Mm. I barely even got to do the prayer because they were like, move it, move it. And I can understand because if if everybody stood there for one minute to do a prayer, then no one's going to be able to see him. Right. So then we left. And we had to try and find uh, a way back to the uh, the college because the buses weren't wor- running at that time. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> but, you know, there's like certain night buses, but they don't go like everywhere. And, right. You know, so you get as close as you can. You walk the rest away. We we got back to, the, I think, the college around 4, 430 in the morning. Wow. But had I not done that, I think I would have regretted it. The other thing was I was also there for the canonization of two uh, saints. One was for Mother Teresa. Mm. And there I was just in the crowd with everybody else. But I went down there on that Sunday. The beatification. just. I mean, beatification, yes. I'm sorry. Beatification, yes. And the other was the uh, the canonization, though, of uh, Nabatala el-Hardini, mm. which was a... Uh, a very special event for me. First of all, I was I was able to give out communion on that day. I was mm. at the altar. Beautiful. But also because I had been commemorating him as a seminarian when he was venerable. Mm. And I remember in my home parish, some people would say, why are you always mentioning that guy, that Houdini guy? <laughs> I said, he's not Houdini, Hardini. Well, nobody knows who he is. I said, one day this this gentleman will be a saint and you mm. will be regretting what you're saying. And they came up to me later. They said, you're right. And the reason it was very special for me was because that first time I went to Lebanon in 98, the day before I left, my maternal grandmother had been at the hospital and they had found a spot on her lungs. They had mm. done a, a X-ray or something. Mm-hmm. So my my mom said, please pray for your grandmother. I said, I, of course. So I went, when I went to Lebanon, the first thing I wanted to do that week is go to the to the shrine where venerable, he was still venerable at the mm. time, Hardini. That's really his, not even his name. It's He's from the village of Hardin, <laughs> but everybody calls him that. Where he, he was, uh, where he was entombed. So a friend of mine took me there. And at the time, because he still wasn't moved up the ladder, you could actually go up to the tomb and touch it. Oh, wow. And so I went there and I, I pray and I just did a simple prayer. Do what you can for my grandmother. Mm, that's sweet. The next week I called home. In the meantime, they had done another exam on my grandmother. and The spot was gone. Wow, how beautiful. And then that year in 98, he was beatified and I was in Lebanon still at the time. And uh, I went to, they had then moved his body into a more fancy tomb and put him behind glass and everything. Now <laughs> you can't. So I was able to go up and actually touch his tomb where now you mm. can't approach. So that was a very special time for me. So I have a very big devotion to him. And thank God I have a, I have a relic of him. Oh, wow. Beautiful. Yeah. And uh, so that was kind of sort of the conclusion of that. I was able to go for his, I was, you know, able to be at his tomb when he was venerable. I was in Lebanon at, at his tomb when he was beatified. <laughs> and then I was able to be in Rome when he was canonized. It's like you're stalking him. I know. <laughs> now, the, 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 of course, the big funny thing was, though, he was canonized. Uh, he was the only man. The rest were all women. In, the, uh, in the, his life, his uh, mother and sister wanted to visit him. When he went into the, to the monastery... He refused to ever see them again. He didn't want. To, he, wow. he he shunned all women. He would never speak to a woman. So God has a sense of humor, doesn't <laughs> he? He right. canonizes them with all women. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Yes. Well, Father Claude, we're just uh, just coming to the end of our time. Thank you so much for for all that you've shared. It's uh, exciting to get a window into the into your life, into the your journey of faith. Thank you. Can you lead us in a little prayer and offer a blessing? Sure. How about we, I'll do the Lord's Prayer in Syriac. 
That would be fantastic. Abunda Bashmayo, Neth Kadashishmoch, Tite Malkutoch, Nehwe Sabionoch, Icano de Bashmayo of Baro, Hablan Lahmon, the Sunkanan Yomono, Washbuklan Haubain, Wachtohain, Icano Dof Hanan, Spaken Lahayo Bain, Ulo Tatlan Lesuno, Elo Fatson Menbisho, Metu de Dilohi Malkuto, Wahilo with the Spurto Lolam O Mean. Amen. Amen. Chalisha baka wa barik mirazaka wa ra'u wa rfa'u ilal abad. Save your people and bless your inheritance. Feed them and carry them forever. Amen. Amen, amen. Father Claude Franklin, thank you so much for taking the time to share your faith journey with us. Thank you, Father Boniface.